Then during the Speedo period in May of 43, when the Japanese were desperate to finish the railroad, there were no more days off. Even the sick were put to work. The workload went up from one and a half cubic meters to 2.2 to 2.8, then finally to 3.2 cubic meters per man per day. They kept increasing the workload. May was also the beginning of the rainy season when we could get as much as 250 inches of rain in the season. It was like being under Niagara Falls. It was bad enough to carry dirt the way we did, but carrying waterlogged dirt just added to the load. Of course, by this time, most people had no shoes. So even carrying 50 pounds on slippery ground was almost impossible. Everybody was under pressure. The Japanese and Korean guards started a reign of terror. They would bash us for no apparent reason, except they thought it might help us speed up the work. During one of the Allied bombing raids, the bombers took out part of the bridge at Tamarkan. To get the freight across the damaged bridge, we had to unload it, walk it across a wooden bridge, and reload it onto boxcars on the other side of the river. We worked like that for five days and five nights without sleep. Up to that time, we would have never thought that possible, but we soon found out, as far as the human body was concerned, anything was possible. So it's true, a POW never says, that's my limit, because for him, there is no limit. So considering the high rates of injuries, illnesses, and casualties from the workload, from the beatings, from the poor diet, and from the tropical diseases, what helped you to survive those 42 months of captivity? It was almost as if, when I think back to my childhood, it was almost as if I've been preparing all my life to be a prisoner of the Japanese because of the rice diet. Meager as it was, it was compatible for me. And the foods we were given to eat, like dong gua, which we nicknamed White Death because it was probably 99% water, and jicama, at one time came back with a biscuit for uh, fuqua, which is bitter melon, cooked with chicken livers. I had been working at the Japanese headquarters, and one of the cooks had given me some. When I got back and opened it up, Paul Leatherwood, one of the Jacksboro boys, said, What is that, Ed? I said, It's bitter melon a unique Chinese vegetable. I gave him half a slice to try. And I said, if you spit it out, it's okay, because I warn you right now, it's bitter. And he tasted it, spat it out, and he said, oh my God, you're right, it's bitter. Another time when we were near a river, the guys were horrified when I cooked up a batch of snails and ate them. To sum it up, Leonard Drake, who bumped near me, once said to me, Eddie, you mean to tell me you ate this stuff at home? I said, yep. <laughs> and he said, I don't know how you did it. And I jokingly said, well, what do you think I left home, Leonard? <laughs> It wasn't all bad. We got lucky. We got Dr. Hecking as our camp doctor because he kept our losses down. In fact, our group had the lowest death rate among the 60-odd railroad camps. Dr. Hecking was born and raised in Java, and he went to medical school in the Netherlands. But as far as the British were concerned, he was not a qualified medical officer. So there he was at Tambazad, the base camp, just surplus. Captain Persimmons and Lieutenant Lattimore used their watches to bribe the Japanese to get Dr. Hecking as our doctor. 
He turned out to be a godsend because he already knew quite a bit about tropical medicine. His grandmother had taught him about herbs and he had learned tropical medicine while stationed for five years in the Celebes. He told us right from the start, once we use up everything in our medical bags, the Japanese will not give us anything more. So I will try to help you heal yourselves. I'll tell you what kind of medicinal and edible plants to look for in the jungle. I'll tell you how not to get into trouble. And I'll tell you how to keep your wounds from being reinfected. Dr. Hecking saved my life twice. Once when I had two tropical ulcers, one on, e one on each leg, and he had to scrape the death ray with a sharpened spoon. And the second time when I had malaria and dysentery. This was the sickest I ever got. I was down to 60 pounds in skin and bones. The medic did the usual thing. He gave me quinine for the malaria. It turns out that I'm allergic to quinine. Mm. And Dr. Hecking had to shock me out of the allergy. So there's nothing I won't do for Dr. Hecking, like scrounging food or medicine for the hospital. <laughs>